All right, we are back. It's another Sunday night, and we are really excited to have someone who I've gotten a chance to meet both in person and then online a few times and been on her podcast a few times talking about a few different things and had a chance to talk about books, but I'm extremely excited to have Rochelle here with us today, joining the Mentor Roundtable. Mm -hmm. She had so many books to choose from to talk about tonight. We could have had like a four hour episode, but I really wanted to focus on her new book. And we'll get into that in a second because we are focusing on really some changing times, some really, some different te teaching techniques. And as we continue to support our new educators, I thought it was a good fit. So I don't wanna keep talking about you, but I'd love for you to share a little bit about who you are, your journey into education and what you've been up to. Yeah, so, well, thank you for having me, first of all. I'm excited to be here. Always love to talk about all things related to education. And I'm excited to see who's joining in too. The names keep popping up. So thanks to everybody who's joining in. Um, I am Rochelle Dene Poth. I am a, let's see, a Spanish and STEAM teacher. I've also been a French teacher um, in a school. It's a junior, senior high school about, I think my school is about 10 miles um, away from Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And mm -hmm. so I have been teaching for a long time. I won't say how many years, all truth be told. I don't actually know the exact number at this point because it has been a long time. We don't so, have to count. Um, we won't count. Yeah, no. But I have been at my school for a while. And um, in addition to teaching, I'm also a consultant love writing, love learning, um, also an attorney. So I don't joke when I say that I love school. And as a kid, I played school all the time. I couldn't wait to come home and play school. And uh, my grandmother was usually there. And I'm like, hey, grandma, guess what I learned today? Do you get to be the student? And um, it was fun. I, I, but it, now that I think back about it, it was really a way that I was actually practicing and learning because some of the things that I had heard do in my classroom, like I remember so well to this day. And I guess it was that just that repetition, plus the fact that it was my grandma. But, um, but anyway, so I keep busy with a lot of things, um, blog, blogs, my Thrive and EDU community, writing, listening to podcasts, recording my own, in which I talk to myself. But uh, People often say, when did you know you want to become a teacher? And I, I didn't, aside from playing school all the time and just loving learning, it wasn't, there wasn't a point in my life where I said, yeah, I want to be a teacher. I mean, when I was a kid, I played it, but it wasn't like, you know, long-term goal and kind of just fell into it in a way when I did my, um, like my undergraduate degree at Penn State. But then through my other experiences, getting different degrees, and then actually going back to law school while teaching full time, that's where I think, I mean, had it not been for law school, I don't think I would still be teaching at this point because I learned so much about what it means to be a teacher. And it, it pushed me to take some different you know, chances in my classroom to build relationships. And so that's been a long time too, but um, I love what I do. I love learning, love connecting. So thank you for having me here tonight. Awesome. No, we're extremely excited. And really, we started this back in the summer talking about really charting a new course with, with our new educators and supporting and, and mentoring. And when I saw that was the title of your book, I said, at some point, we, we have to come on and, and talk about that because Molly and, and Emily have been charting a course all year long from student teaching to coming on board in a, in a new environment. And could you tell us a little bit of, you know, just a quick snapshot, and then we'll have our team jump in. What is the real theme of that, of your book in a two minute kind of elevator speech if someone's saying, what, what is this about? Yeah, I'm glad you limited me. <laughs> <to it. laughs> Give me the, I could probably do it even faster than that, but it's a book, um, it's divided into five chapters and the whole concept of it was with so many things happening in education, in the world, when it comes to technology, plus a lot of the different you know, project-based learning, social emotional learning, app smashing, digital citizenship. There are so many things that as educators that we need to keep up with and stay ahead of. And with so many demands on our time, it's like, we don't always know where to start. And so in writing the book, I really wanted to set out and have this guide that thinking about, you know, as a language teacher, I know, even though I encourage them, hey, we need Spanish teachers. I know they're not all going to become Spanish majors or even use Spanish later on in life, but I need to do more than just give them that, that opportunity to learn Spanish. I have to figure out what can I do in my classroom that's going to best prepare them for whatever it is that they meet after they leave my, my room or school and later on. And so in this book, it just goes through basic skills because we can't assume because kids have technology that they know exactly how to send emails and how to act and interact responsibly. 
um, also, you know, learning about themselves, but their community, and then on a global scale. So the book is is set up so that you don't have to spend a ton of time getting started with a lot of those ideas, nor do you have to read it from the beginning to the finish. You can just say, hey, you know what? I wanna learn about augmented virtual reality. I'm gonna dive right into this chapter. Here's some ideas to get started with. And, and you don't have to worry about like, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming. Like, where do I begin? You just pick, give it a try. And if that doesn't work, you try another one. Nice, so we've been charting courses all year. So I'd love for our team to jump in, share some things. If you, and for those of you who are with us tonight, feel free to add um, questions, thoughts, ways you've done some things differently this year. So I'm gonna turn it over to the four of you. What are some of the things that you've charted this year that are different? I know Emily and Molly, this is your first year. So you've had to change and adapt almost weekly. So I'd just love to hear from some, what you're all doing. Okay, I'll go. Yes, we were all we we made a pact because you never don't jump in that we're gonna no. wait in, in silence until Melissa jumps in. I feel for the like first I say the same thing every time. Um, so my course is completely different, obviously, because I'm completely virtual. So um, I think the biggest obstacle was expanding my mind and saying that I can do this. It is not going to be that difficult. And as soon as my mindset was switched, I think that everything fell into place perfectly. And I can honestly say that that I've done pretty much 90% of, of what I did in the classroom. Um, now, remotely? Yes. Wow, it's impressive. We can, still you share, can you share what you did this week? Because it was really cool. You were the, like the most humble person when it comes to talking about yourself. Share your project this week. Be, be, What's this? Brag one? a little. Sure. Um, we are having World Read Aloud Day. So I invited policemen, firemen, um, our admin, principal, parents. So we have a whole schedule on one day where it's not small groups. It's all kids hopping on with their pillow and their stuffy and just listening to stories all day. And then Tuesday is our 100 day and it's a glow theme. So. <laughs> So we have a bunch of glow stuff. I have a game that they're going to do, which is kind of like a math game and it's it's a glow. So it's gonna be up on the screen and they have to set their iPads up and they have to be away from it. And we're in teams of two teams. And so I'll call out their names and they'll run and have to put the correct answer by. So there's numbers around the circle and then there's in the middle, it, it, I can put plus five or plus four. So the numbers they're gonna add each part. So they run over, put the number, go back, call someone's name and they have to run up and do the same thing. So we would do that on a whiteboard at school, but now it's virtual and we can still do it. So there'll be like a review game we're gonna do and it's just gonna be a lot of fun stuff. And then the following week, we're gonna do our Super Bowl transformation. So that'll be fun too. Nice. And, and Errol, I know besides just changing uh, schools and, and grades and locations. What is something this year you've done that's charted a new course that you're really excited about and share? And that's... Oh, everything is so different for me. Um, like you said, I'm teaching in a new district with a new grade, a new subject. Um, but I started Teachers College this year and I've never really used a reading and writing workshop program. And it's really, the workshop model has been up my opportunity so much to conferencing with students. And I'm really enjoying the goal setting. And I, I usually am not like, oh, wow, I love this curriculum, but I love the workshop model this year, especially because I can't sit with small groups of students. So to have the structure of the workshop model, but working with students on how to set their own goals and it's very individualized this year. It's been really nice for me and I'm really missing the sitting with the small group of students around the kidney shaped table, but I'm really trying to find ways to adapt and learning from all of you. And I feel like everything this year, I've been charting a new way at every- right, How about it? It just feels that feel way. Like everything for me is different. I name a million, <laughs> name a million things, but um, Melissa, your week sounds Wonderful. <laughs> I, I wish I was a student in your class. It sounds like so much fun. So Rochelle, the, uh, the big piece of what we started to do was really support our new educators like Emily and Molly. If you were to say, because one of the things that concerns me a little bit is that, yes, this is all different and this is 
a new way, but we actually have to start coming out of it at some point. What are some things that you can share with our new educators to say, yes, this isn't the way it is, but how we can start to work towards a new normal and, and keep that. Like Emily and Molly were just sharing today, they haven't been in in a couple of weeks or longer, and now they're only in for half a day. And then who knows what Tuesday or Wednesday will bring. So how do our new educators keep that stamina going? Yeah, that's that's an excellent it's an excellent question. But the one the thing that comes to mind all the time for me is like I and this was a choice. I kept myself so isolated. And, it, and granted, when I started teaching, we didn't have all the tech and all the ways to connect that we do today. I mean, there were conferences or just within your in your school, but it's hard even in your school building. The people that teach right next door to me, unless I'm, I mean, I'm standing in the hallway, I often don't see them or and we're a small school. You know, you see people from downstairs like wow, you're, you're you still teach here, you're still in the school. I haven't seen you in like months. And so the beauty of the way things are now, um, I mean, take it away from like, oh, we're, we're, we're stuck at home or we're not in our classrooms is we have all of these spaces where we can't connect. And like, just gonna go back to Melissa here for a second. I, I, I see every time she posts something that she's doing in her classroom with those kids and the activities and the creativity, and it's like, they're all in their homes. Melissa's in her space at home, creating these amazing learning experiences. And I got to be a part of one of those uh, mystery Zooms a couple- Yeah, that was, I, I did that as well. It was super fun. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. And um, I think it's hard, especially, you know, it doesn't matter how much experience that you've had, how much exper experience with tech that you've had, how long you've been teaching, because when schools closed in March, it was just like, what do we do? <laughs> Where do we begin? How do we sort through all of, the, all of the choices that are out there? And the best advice I can give is one, you know, don't keep yourself isolated. Make sure you're connecting in the right spaces, whether that's on Facebook or Twitter or Clubhouse now is another great right, one. That, <laughs> Throw that one right today? out there. Did, were you? Were you in the? I was. Were, yeah. You were on the Buncey one yesterday. Yeah, I, I had a meeting yesterday, so I missed the Buncey one. But uh, I was on the one with, this morning with Bonnie, talking, yeah. and uh, so that's a great space too. Just because it's important to know that you're not alone and that there's other people out there that experience it, but it's easy to feel like there's so much to do and you can't take on all the things, even though we try. So you have to just find small little chunk things that you can do that you can do consistently and so i'm going to go back to melissa just because you know why not <laughs> just say but, you know setting up that that um that, that excitement that her kids clearly have for the activities with those mystery zooms because it's great for them they're building so many skills in the process and there is a time commitment involved in setting all of that up but once you decide on like your one big thing maybe it is just one big thing you do that every single week and you look forward to it. It doesn't become like, oh my gosh, I got to set this thing up. It takes forever. You get into that flow of it. Um, or you just have like, if I would show you all the little post-it notes and things I have here, it's almost embarrassing. Some, some might say, well, why don't you just write in a notebook? I'll never open that notebook. Right, I need about different it? colored post-it notes. I know where they are. I showed my students one time, I had like a red, like manila folder, but a red folder. And there were, there was stuff all over it. And I said, what, how does this make you feel? They're like full of anxiety, stress. Like, what is that? You know, and they said, I know where everything is. It just works, but it's reminders to myself. Like, here's my list of activities. And I did a couple of them this week. Like I was feeling, you know, the last couple of weeks, like, oh, that was a terrible lesson. I could have done that so much better. It didn't go well. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And if you let yourself feel like that so much, then you are going to be like, okay, like, where do I go from here? But if you have a couple of ideas, you try them, and keep those notes and, and jot down things that go well and then come back to it and reflect on it. So it's no wonder why I have post-it notes everywhere, but you know, just little ideas here and there. That was kind of, that was definitely more than a two minute. On that one. That's all right. It was, it was some great stuff. And, and, and I, you know, a, a big part of what we do is also to help those new educators who, who watch. And, and of course our, our two superstars here, Emily and Molly. So yeah, I was glad it kept going because there's some good stuff. So Emily and Molly, we're going to call you up to the stage, as, as we say. I would love to hear some of the things that, that you have done or if you have questions on how to really, oh, he's back. He's in and out. Dennis is like, I was here. I'm out. I'm sorry. I can't believe it. I can't get my name right. One of these, we'll, we'll figure it out. Don't worry. Don't worry about the name thing. I told you. <laughs> I just came to say hello. To, Rochelle, how you doing? I just came to say hi. Good. Sorry, well, don't, don't, are you leaving now? You just jump in? No, and no. I, I'm going to stay now. Right. I'm gonna okay. change my name, too. All right, good. Hi, everyone. Aaron, Dennis, Matt, nice to see you, man. Melissa, so, Emily, and Molly. <laughs> uh, so, 
Emily and Molly, I'd love to hear from you what you've done that is a little bit different than what you would have thought, but something you're really excited to share and because doing that helps us all learn. Sure. I mean, Molly and I both went through our student teaching I in the sure. fall last year. So we got the experience of like a normal classroom with the morning rugs and the circles and the tables and a lot of the things we still can do. But I feel like at least for me, the spacing in inside the classroom and having to follow like all the COVID regulations is so difficult because we can't do the small groups and they can't be in pods and you're not really supposed to like turn and partner talk or I'll go up to the board at one time. And so I get really stuck with trying to switch up my lessons because I feel like I end up doing the same things all the time because they're only allowed to stay at their desk and not really allowed to move around the room because of the rules at our school. And so I find myself kind of stuck with creativity with those kiddos sometimes, but then that's kind of the beauty of remote. I also teach one fully remote class for reading and I find like guided reading and small group and partner work is so easy with that just because we can throw everyone into breakout rooms all the time. And so it's almost like I'm creating two different lifestyles, like one where we have lots of small groups and partnerships and then another class where we can't do that. And so I think with creativity in class, like trying to follow the rules is where I struggle the most because I just never really know what we can do. And so I, I try to come up with things, but I think that's the one spot that's the hardest. Yeah, so my school is hybrid and remote. So we've been switching back and forth a lot. The main goal in a perfect world with no cases, we would be hybrid right now. So I, that includes me teaching my kids in class and my kids online at the same time. That's how my school does it. So I have my computer up with my Google Meet and my kids in my classroom sitting in front of me. So that is definitely just a challenge in itself to work out the timing, to make sure everyone's getting enough attention. And then when we go through these spurts where cases are rising in town, we go full remote. And so I feel like we've gone back and forth like three or four times now. And it's like, all right, I just got in the swing of this. So next time we go back to remote, I need to remember to do this because this worked really well. So like, it's almost like starting new every single time and like re-remembering all the routines. Um, I definitely feel what Emily said. When my kids are all remote, although it's amazing for them to be in school and it's so much easier to do work and hold them accountable and for them to be invested, they also get such a benefit from being remote because that's the only time they're really all together and seeing each other. So it's like an A week, B week schedule at my school. So when we're hybrid, those two weeks don't see each other at all. Like those kids never see each other except for on screen to screen and morning meetings. So I think the new territory that kind of keeps getting charted over and over again is like, what was the best way to do this last time? And how can I remember that? And how can I make it better? I feel like creatively, I've been doing pretty well this year. Like we do do a lot of fun things, but it's just a lot of work and sometimes a struggle to make sure I'm keeping up that creativity in both settings. Yeah, and, and, and having that juggling match is, is different. And like you just said, for tomorrow, you're in both settings in, in one singular day. So that, that's tricky. Dennis, nice of you to join. And I thought you were going to change your name, but we'll just go with it. So, and, and you're on mute. Like, can someone help us? Where's Jason? Like, get there him in go. here to help so, you. So, Matt, you know, I wore this shirt just for you today. Nice. Um, I'm so happy and, for you. You know, no bow tie or anything. And then, like, my great friend is also like our guest today. Um, I think you're going to ask me, like, from a principal standpoint, how is it with our. Have I become that predictable? I like it. That's good. Yes. But you I do have. Well, while you're talking, we have a Rochelle super fan coming on. So as you talk, we're going to have somebody pop up. We try to bring in a few people every so often. So Dennis, take it away. And then we'll have a super fan. I thought fan I was coming. the super fan. I thought I was the super fan. I guess well, you're, part, you're, fan you're here every week. So here. Um, it's uh, one of the things that um, I did, Matt, and I'm going to do some more of it uh, these upcoming weeks is um, I actually took the time to volunteer, um, to co-teach with a teacher that was teaching in a hybrid model. Uh, it's one thing when you sit back and you uh, are trying to tell people what to do, but you really don't experience it. It's mm -hmm. completely different when you like actually go through the entire process and then you get a different understanding of what it's like. 
and it's hard to plan for something if you've never experienced it if you don't know what it's like uh i love to teach so it wasn't a big deal for me but it was a challenge to say i have 10 kids virtual and I have 10 kids or 15 kids in front of me how do you navigate that how do you make sure everybody's getting the attention to things that molly was saying but then um the teacher that i was working with she built like a very collaborative culture so she made sure that um, there are different ways that she tried to integrate the virtual scholars like we had them projected. Um, some kids even had um, their laptops at their desk so that they could still interact with small groups with the kids that were actually remote when the teacher put them in breakout rooms. So it was just being um, just really flexible and thinking um, the whole notion that there is no box. That was really beneficial for us um, when we're trying to like say like, what's the best way to collaborate? And the thing is, we also have to remember like, we're probably never gonna go back to the way things used to be right. because of the experience that we've had. So instead of trying to hold on to like what we once knew, it's how do we embrace the current reality and make it the best learning opportunities for everybody moving forward. Nice. So Rochelle, we brought Christine Beavis with us today. For those of you who do not know, she's a super fan from Massachusetts. She, I think she, she knows is. most of the folks on here, except actually our new, new educators, but she speaks very highly of both of you. So now that you're up on the main stage here, um, what do you got for us? What have you been doing this different this year that's charting a new course? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really sort of on the spot. Thanks, Matt. I was Always. texting Matt, telling him, oh, I really love this. And um, so what have I been doing that's new? Um, well, I'm a mix of hybrid and remote, so that can be present, as you guys have just talked about, so many challenges. I've been teaching 21 years. And every day seems to be a new day. But what's really, I've always weaved into all of my years is developing a sense of a real strong community. So at the end of every day, whether we're hybrid, remote, a mix of sort of both, I guess, um, we do this thing called caring class and community. And on our remote days, um, we bring in the families that are in the background that are watching the Zooms or supporting my littlest learners. So they jump in, they read books. We had a grandmother last week from Trinidad that um, shared her favorite story and that was huge. Um, we have many dogs and cats and, and lots of different um, people. In that your classroom? Us. And 15 minutes at the end of every day, we have our caring class and community parts. So people join in, they read poems, they might share their favorite part of a book, or they might just tell a knock knock joke. So um, that's- Do you have one for us? Um, I do one every day and the kids, the kids just love it. It's so corny, knock knock. Who's, Who's there? there? Yeah, right. Lena, Lena who? And well, I say, Lena, a little closer, boys and girls. And I'm going to tell you another knock knock joke. Everybody loves it. They <laughs> rule their eyes. When I don't remember to share it, they. I hope they, you don't answer for them like you just did for all of us. Like you didn't even give us well, a chance to participate. I didn't know what you, I didn't know what you would do. All right, do. try it again. Do another one. Uh, no, I don't really don't have another one. Come on. <laughs> I don't, but it's a pleasure to see all you guys and to listen. And for the newer um, teachers, you guys impress me week after week, even if I don't participate because I go to bed early. I am so impressed with your, I guess your, your wherewithal and your, your shifting and your flexibility and your thinking. It's amazing to me because 21 years, some days I don't, I don't feel like I know what the heck I'm doing. And I love your honesty, you newer teachers. And I know, say it newer very lightly. I, I appreciate at how upfront you are or transparent um, you seem to be about teaching because this is not for everyone. Um, all right, before I send, all right, oh, before, I, before I send you back, uh, we're gonna get a picture with you up here, you ready? I am in my PJs, absolutely not. Well, I'm doing it either with you participating or are you barking at the screen? What would you like? Um, I don't typically bark, but- <laughs> All right, well, here we go. Be ready. Oh, all right, you look great. Melissa always yells at me too, so. Oh, uh, holy gee. All right, well, thanks for, for joining us and uh, we'll laugh about Good it job. another time for sure. Dennis. So, Rochelle, as we start to continue um, moving forward, what are some things and strategies you could share with educators to continue to build on what they've done? Because sometimes we change or we think of change and we just continually do it, but we don't build on anything. What would be something you could share to either you've done or you suggest from any of the books that keeps that student momentum moving forward? 
Yeah. And I, I do have to go something back to uh, like Emily and Molly were talking like my school, we started off virtual for the first nine weeks and then we went to hybrid the second nine weeks. And it, it is, it's tough. I mean, there are some days where we're we'll balancing all the things, you know, the kids are coming in, I'm, I'm ripping the paper towels, I'm wiping down the desks and, you know, like five minutes and then I'm teaching the kids in the class and the kids at home. And some days I have one or two kids in class and the rest of them are online. And some days it's just me in the classroom and everybody's at, at home and, you know, the cameras aren't on. And um, so one thing that I have been doing, because like, I do respect the fact that they're on the, the screens all day and they may not want to turn the cameras on for whatever reason. Although one time one of the students said, well, you know, I was out to lunch during class. I didn't want you to yell at me. I was like, well, I don't, do you go anywhere good? First of all, because if you want somewhere really good and I'm jealous, I might yell at you, but uh, I'm kidding. I would never do that. But Fridays I, I get all excited. I'm like Friday faces. You know what that means? Yeah, we got to turn our cameras on. I'm like, you got it. Yes. <laughs> turn the cameras on. <laughs> like just one minute. I said, you have no idea what it's like when I'm sitting here and there's nobody in the room with me and I'm just talking to myself basically on the screen. There's nobody there. And they they put those cameras on so fast. And it's always funny to see who puts it on first. And they're, you know, I said, okay, who's where's ceiling fan? Because usually there's like ceiling fan or some whatever in the background. But I really think they enjoy doing that. Or else they, they know that just because it's like for one minute, because when I say, okay, you turn them off, it's always fun to see who the first one is. They're like, they're gone. You know, I'm not even done saying you turn the camera off. But um, things that I've been doing is like, I, I tried to go back the whole time, ever since schools closed back in the spring last year, I tried to think about, you know, not necessarily bringing on a lot of new tools or strategies or whatever, because everything was so overwhelming anyway but also using it as an opportunity to try some different things, all, although maybe staggered in when I was trying in my classes, but then thinking about methods and tools that enable us to make those transitions that I think that's what makes a big difference. So, I mean, just throwing out things like if you do project-based learning or genius hour, where essentially, you know, the kids don't necessarily have to be staring at the computer screen the whole time, because that's really hard to do. And for right. me, I mean, I had, I had students teaching Spanish that didn't have their books or materials at home. And it really forced me to look at what I was, what I was using because I found out there's answers all over the internet. So I'm like giving them the assignments in the book because I think it's good practice. And I tell them, I'm not going to assign anything for you to do unless I really believe it's going to benefit you. Your hand is not going to fall off, even though they say, my hand's going to fall off. Like, my hand's not going to fall Always. off. But it wasn't meaningful because they could find the answer. So it pushed me to think like, what is something, what are some things that I can bring into my class, whether it's me creating or, or more importantly, since I teach older students, giving them more of a chance to actually figure out how they, they should practice based on where they feel they are in learning and helping them to set some goals. And, you know, like I said, I have those lists of different ideas um, for teachers, especially if you are finding, you know, on a weekly basis, I mean, my school, or hybrid and then you have to close whether it's a snow reason or if it's just because of cases or something and so you might be in the middle of a lesson where you're relying on being in your classroom to show whatever it is that you're doing and then next thing you know you're not in your classroom and so having things out there like if you do things like choice boards or hybrid docs that i mean they are not difficult to get started with and that's that's the great thing is like when you're connected or even if you're just starting to get connected you can find so many ready to go resources available you can go into like a Buncee or nearpod and find thousands of templates games using like the cahoots and the quizzes where your students are like wow this is great you made this you're like yep made it from scratch meanwhile it's like there's a library all you did was just find one make sure there aren't any errors and, and use that. And I think that's, they're always like, this, this one's wrong. I'm like, yeah, that, that wasn't me. I didn't do that, you know, but I do, I do own up whenever I make a mistake, which does happen quite often. But I think just having, you know, this toolkit of options that you can pull from. So in the event that, you know, you are virtual for a day or you, not that you want to give students like a break all the time because right. we want to keep learning. And, and some of my students say, well, yeah, we're, we're good. We're sitting here, you know, I'm chilling and laying on my bed. I'm like, You're supposed, you would be doing that in school. What are you doing at home? But um, having some things there like to use as a backup and kind of adding in just random things. I found a, last week we did um, a breakout rooms and I had jam boards set up for my students in Spanish to kind of do presentations because a lot of them didn't want to do their presentations in front of their peers 
whether they're in the classroom or online. And I said, fine, we're going to do breakout rooms within your breakout rooms. Then you can share, you can talk about your project and then just post on the Jamboard. And then uh, I came across this thing called PuzzGrid. And, and PuzzGrid, is that what it's <laughs> yeah. called? Yeah, it's like puzzle, but take off the L-E and it's PuzzGrid. And you go and you can create, it's kind of like a Connect Four game. So you have four different, and Dr. Hari is, kind of, is Googling it, but you can- uh, <laughs> you Find you the get, link, throw it in the chat. Yeah, you you get um, it just opens up. You hit submit, and you have categories of words. So for me, my Spanish one is working on foods right now. So I put four fruits, four vegetables, four drinks, four side dishes, for example, and you type them in. And then you have to put what the link is. And so you put fruits or vegetables, and then you submit it, and it goes to an email. So if it comes back to you, then you have the link for that game. You can share it for anybody to try, or you can edit it. And so I had them play one and, you know, they go through, you click on them. So it's helping them to kind of build their language skills. Like what do these mean? What's the connection? And then figuring out the link and then it has a time limit. So I thought, okay, this is great. It doesn't take long for us teachers to do, but depending on the age of students, like diving into here's a breakout room, you're building comfort because you have that small group, you're sharing your projects, you're posting on the jam board, everybody else can see. And then I added on that, that puzz grid, which is kind of fun to do because then I had them create their own within their group. So they typed it in, I had them use my email address. So all of them came to me, I could put in all the accent marks that were missing on all the Spanish words. But then now we have like 10 of them because they made one, they're like, this is cool. This is the best day ever doing these different nice. activities. So, you know, it doesn't like those, that doesn't take a lot of time. I mean, breakout room, just click a jam board. They're doing the work, you know, you're just kind of floating in and around, but I don't know. That was what I was working on last week. Although it didn't go perfect every single time because the one class, I, it just, I don't know what happened. The breakout rooms weren't working as well. And mm -hmm. You know, they forgot that it they could actually send me a I'm message. You said that, to be honest with you, because a lot of times we think things just go smooth. So to hear you, yeah, you no. you've accomplished and do a oh lot of the technology that it's not working, like it's actually comforting for, for, for some of us. So, so that's awesome. So we have about 10 more minutes. And one of the things I wanted to end on, and I'll end with you, Rochelle, I'll ask our team, is that I know we've said charting a new course a lot. It's the first half of your, the title of your um, book, but the second half is essential skills for, you know, in, in education in the new world. I'd love for our team to each share something they think right now is an essential skill. So, so for me, one of the things that I've been really pushing as an essential skill for our edu educators is critical thinking. How are we getting students to think differently? Because when they're in the classroom, we have some eye contact, we have interactions, you have mobility, you can move around, you can ask some more and different types of questions. When you have 30 faces looking back at you, how are you moving away from the remembering lessons? Meaning you teach something, they remember it and you move on. And, and, and moving up to the creating and analyzing. So we've been really pushing that, using our questioning techniques to push our students to think differently, to have debates, to, to essentially sign two different sides. Even if the people don't agree with it, to learn about the other person's opinions and, and learn about, I mean, with all the current events now, we can have a lot of debate about issues and topics. And so that's been one of the essential skills that I've been pushing in our district is how are we getting students to think critically? And then on top of that would be then have their own voice in their learning. But the skill would be learning how to develop high level questioning techniques is definitely something we've been working on. So I'd love to throw it out to the team. And Rochelle, I'm going to end with you as kind of the wrap up of one of the ones that either maybe we didn't talk about there, you think like this is critically essential. And I think we lost Dennis or sorry. Oh, there he is. So take it away team. One of your essential skills. I can go. Um, so an essential skill that I think educators need to have right now is adapting to what your students want. Um, I think that kids are not really getting a lot of say in anything right now. They aren't getting to choose whether they go to school, whether they're hybrid, whether they're remote. If they are lucky enough to be the ones that are going to school all the time, they have to wear a mask. They can't sit next to their friends. They can't eat lunch with their friends and so on. So I feel like giving them a choice in what you're doing in your classroom, like obviously within 
limits, still following the curriculum and things is really important. So giving them a lot of choices and taking their feedback into consideration. Like even if you think you're doing something really good and they're like, no, we did not like that. Switching it up and like not being offended by that. And Rochelle, like huge shout out because I struggled so much in Spanish in high school and doing <laughs> presentations in front of my class was like my worst nightmare. I would hate to get up and speak. So it's really cool that you gave them a different option to do something with less people and made them feel comfortable. So that's a great example of adapting to what your <laughs> students want. While we're unmuted, something that I think, I think educators should, I mean, all people in general just need to have really good teamwork skills. And I think that's something we've been working with my third graders in, especially because some of them have higher levels than others. And I think it's at an age where you can really start helping each other. And we've been, or I have been trying to work with them to teach them how like, not one person should be the boss. Not one person should be doing everything on the project or just because you're really good at this doesn't mean that other people can't help you with it too. And so we've been working a lot with teamwork and that's like a tough skill for adults sometimes too, like giving over the reins to some other people. And so kind of practicing those skills with the kiddos too. Awesome, um, those are fabulous. I love the two of you went first. You're like, yeah, we've only been teaching six weeks or six months. We're gonna share some essential skills for you. We're first, everybody. I'll I was gonna take mine. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. <laughs> oh, that's a good way to look at it. Like I have, a, I have like two answers. Let me make sure I get them in first. Um, I'll take mine's turn now and I'll go to the chat because um, Michael Harvey put it in there. Um, educators, if we want kids to really engage in critical thinking, we have to be able to critically think about how we're teaching. Um, if we're not modeling critical thinking, we can't just expect our students to grasp that concept. The more and more that we engage in deeper conversations and deeper questioning and critical thinking, it will carry over into our scholars, our students based on the lessons that we create for them and their learning opportunities. I like it for sure. Well, Molly and Emily, I was going to say what you said. So thank See, you. See, the going strategy to worked, Molly. I like it. So funny. Um, pandemic or not, I feel like every educator needs to be empathetic and share that with your students. And this is something I'm really working on this year. And I do consider myself a really empathetic person, but just sharing that with my students on how to touch into your empathy more and how to treat people the way that you want to be treated and just know that everyone's going through something. And this year, especially, I feel like I'm in person five days a week. I've only done remote one time because I was quarantined and you know, my students will come to school and then sometimes they're like, I wish I was home. But when you're home, you wish you were in school. And it's just going, I think it was a little bit of a wake up call for them when they were home being like, wow, we're so grateful that we can be with each other every day. And I'm like, well, there are children that want to be in school and can't. And there are children that are in school and want to be home and trying to make it relatable to children. And I think all educators should just continue to be as compassionate as this group is because I see it on Sundays and I see it when I'm at work and I hope that other people are the same way that we are. Awesome, and before we go to M Melissa, I saw, Jeff, I saw your hand was up and I threw in the chat. I didn't know if you had a question, you wanted to share, if you wanted to come on screen and share something that you have an essential skill, throw it in the chat what you wanted to do um, and happy to um, have you part of it. So um, also we, Michael through, I think it was Michael through the, Puzz grid into the, the chat as well. Um, so it's in there if you want. I just clicked on it, opened it, and we'll check it out later. So, Michelle, take or Melissa, take it away. Um, I was just going to say, mine's not very scientific, but I was just going to say, fun. This is a time where everyone is stressed. Parents are stressed. They can't. Um, some of us, it's a nightmare to try and even help our kids with schoolwork, and I am definitely in that boat. So just having fun, uh, laughing at yourself, laughing every day. Um, I think it's, it's, this is the only year they're ever going to be in this grade. So why not make it memorable? I like that. Uh, that's, I, I haven't heard that before. I say that a lot when I was an elementary principal. I had some, you know, go-tos, uh, like, by the time they leave elementary school, we've had them half our lives, you know, different or their lives. But that's a good one. So it's the only year they'll be in this grade. I really like that. A great one. 
That's a great one, Matt. You you guys you guys saw it the right way. That's a great one. Okay. So sorry your Dennis comes in and says that is a great one. So we're gonna take it up a notch. Um, so as we as we wrap up, Rochelle, we're gonna be giving away one of your books. We're gonna make that announcement tomorrow between people who have been tweeting and people who signed up. We're gonna do a random uh, drawing. And I wanna thank you for your time, but I'd love for you to leave us with one of your essential skills for educators for tomorrow. Yeah, I, I don't, it's hard to follow up what everybody else has already said. So many, so much <laughs> wisdom coming through there. But for me, I always kind of go back to, you know, like my own experience where I was isolated, I kept to myself and I, I still, I mean, I think every day about like how thankful I am for all the connections I do have, not just for myself, my own learning, but for what I've been able to bring in for my students, whether directly because I've connected my students with other educators, other students in other classrooms, specifically like Argentina and Spain, um, which last year as schools were closed, being able to have conversations with students who were experiencing the lockdown in Spain, which, and they were having a completely different experience than we were at that same time, just it helped them on so many levels and specifically like social emotional learning skills and you know talking about like empathy and that, that social awareness. And I think it's, um, you know, what I've learned more is it's, I mean, the content is great and wanting them to speak Spanish is great and helping them to build their skills, you know, technology with all of that, that they need for now and in the future, that is too, but being mindful of circumstances of the students and being intentional to really understand like what they're experiencing, but also sharing what we're experiencing too, so that they don't feel like, yeah, nobody else feels the same way. You know, I, I'm, I'm not doing this right, or I'm never going to get this. Um, just opening up our stories to them. And I think that is something, doesn't matter how much tech we have, doesn't matter how many years we've been teaching, right. but, but being open to sharing our own story and encouraging students to share theirs and just fostering that, you know, communication in and out of our classrooms, I think is, is something that's just going to always stand the test of time for a cliche way of saying it. Awesome. Well, that is a great way to, to wrap it up and all the strategies we talked about and all the great things for the essential skills. So Rochelle, thank you for stopping in tonight. And for our team, <laughs> as always, it's great to see all of you listen to all the great things. And Molly and Emily, good luck tomorrow and whatever Tuesday uh, may bring as, as well. So and for those of you tuned in tonight, I threw in some information in the chat if you want to learn more about Rochelle's work and her books and all the great things that she is doing make sure to check that out dennis one last thing before we go how's your vice principal doing how's he holding up first year with you it's funny that you say that we were just talking and he said he feels like every day is a professional development day he <laughs> is engaged um i asked a lot of questions to put it that way uh the fact that he jumped in that jason jumped in and that now because we have more kids in person and we can actually like do more and more classroom visits he's loving that part of it so um, I'm going to make sure he's back with us next week. All right, yeah, tell him we'll this him. week. All I'm right. putting this evaluation. All right. Well, don't tell him to come next week because we will be off next week oh, for the my Super goodness. Bowl. My fault. <laughs> because, uh, well, I was going to say, but you gave me a nice lead into it that uh, I don't see too many people tuning in at 8.30 on Super Bowl Sunday, to, including myself, to, uh, to check out. Although we are all-stars, I think we're, most people will pass. So tell him to come back uh, ASAP. And we have some exciting news <laughs> coming up for the mental round table as well uh, this week. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to the, the team this week and Rochelle, of course, thanks for stopping in. Thank you.